All right, so is it bad to EQ your main and sub after you've done the alignment? Uh, if you've seen any of my other videos or you've taken any other manufacturer trainings, you know that crossover alignment is typically the last thing that we do. So what if you still need to do some EQ after that? How much can you do? Is it going to break your crossover alignment? That's all I want to look at today. And I'll just tell you the short story is that your crossover alignment really is not that fragile. So there's a lot you can do and you just need to know what the limits are. And my first big suggestion is that you just play with this stuff ahead of time. So if you want to gain the confidence for, uh, you know, what you'll be able to do tomorrow in the field, download these measurements ahead of time from Tracebook Subaligner or the manufacturer's website, and then you can play around with them in your audio analyzer and see what kind of changes happen. So let's play around with some things. Now, the first tip I want to give you is, um, the verification step, right? So typical order of operations, verification, placement, aim, EQ, crossover alignment. Verification at the beginning. Why? Um, so on this last uh, theatrical gig that I worked on where I was the sound designer, I just made a video about that. Uh, they told me that I had a certain number of outputs, and this is pretty common uh, in theaters and venues these days where they give you some outputs that are like main sub, front fill, other fills, lobby, green room, these kinds of things. So they, they give you some control over it. That way they feel like they can just basically lock off the system and now you should have enough control from the console to do whatever you need to do. Now whether or not that's actually the best way to go about it, that's a story for another day. Uh, I have some strong feelings about that. But um, they gave me this, so I hook up all my outputs and I start just testing things and I know something strange, I'm not getting the subwoofer output, but when I play signal through the mains, they sound like they have a lot of low end. It sounds like the subs are on. So of course I have to go and do some investigation. There's nobody there but me. So I start uh, looking around in their racks. And once I look at the back of the racks, I realize that the amps do not have a separate input to the subwoofer amp. It's actually just a parallel output, a loop output from the amps that are driving the main speakers to the subs. Totally fine, just that's not what I was told. So I could have started, you know, if I was in a rush, I could have started trying to do my calibration steps, not realizing that uh, I was actually EQing main plus sub, for example. So verification, figuring that stuff out. What are some things that are and, and then I'll just tell you another thing that's going to quickly, obviously, change your crossover alignment, and that's the level relationship between them, right? So if I just go over to my main channel here, and I turn it uh, down by 30 dB, this would be the same as, you know, turning your sub way up, which is what we all do in the field. We can see that our crossover alignment shifts uh, way up in the, to this area. So level offsets, yeah, that's a big deal. So, you know, typically after you do your EQ and before you do your alignment, you find the uh, level relationship that you wanted for your crossover alignment. Okay, so let's remove that. That's an obvious one. But you might have questions like, can I just EQ this bump over here? I mean, it doesn't seem like it's in the crossover region, but is that gonna screw things up? I'll just go ahead and tell you as well that the number one safety thing to do, if you forget all of this stuff from this video and you don't have time to play around with this and you're just nervous, then just EQ everything together. It's not a big deal, right? You've already done your alignment and you're like, oh, I want to change some things. That's fine. Just apply EQ to the combined system. And that's probably a good rule, general guideline to follow in all cases. You do your, you know, solo system EQ of things then you do your alignment and once you combine them, now they're a unit, right? They're a subsystem of systems and, uh, or I should say a subsystem of sources. I don't know. Anyway, now they've basically been tied together. And so now you should treat them as a unit. You bring them up and down together and EQ them together and that kind of stuff. So that's probably a good path to follow. But if I have my alignment here and I like that, I say, oh, I, I want to EQ this thing. Uh, let's go ahead and put some EQ in there. So um, I will use a little helper tool here to help me figure out the right Q setting for these parametric EQ filter. And think in your mind what you think is going to happen. 
Um, you know, before I insert this, let me show you one feature here. If I polarity invert one of these sources, what I wanted to show you is that uh, along this dotted line, we have what is the potential maximum between these two sources. And then this dark black line is the current state of affairs based on all of my settings. So I just broke the crossover alignment basically by inserting a polarity inversion. And now we no longer are hitting our maximum. But if I put that out or uh, take that away, now we're back up to almost maximum here. So we're doing pretty well. So if we see this black line, solid black line start to deviate from the dotted black line, we'll know that we have a problem. So let's insert that EQ filter and think about what we expect to happen before that filter comes in there. Okay, so this isn't very extreme. I haven't seen anything change, but let's insert something more extreme. So instead of minus four, how about minus 14? Okay, so that pushes it way down there. And now we see this black line start to deviate a little bit from this dotted black line, but still not too much. But what's happened here is that we've actually changed the level relationship, right? Uh, up here, before this filter was inserted, we were in isolation. We're way up here. These two guys are no longer interacting anymore. But inserting this um, deep filter, now we've pushed these two relationships together and now they're interacting. And if we go over and look at the phase graph, I bet we'll find out that they are not aligned here. No, they're not. So they're almost 180 degrees apart, it looks like. Okay, getting up into this area. But they're not so close and level that we're starting to actually see a cancellation. We're just not getting all of the summation that we'd like to get between these two guys. So that's really the major thing to look out for is if you're inserting a filter that creates such a big shift that now you really, we've made the crossover region a lot bigger. So before, maybe the crossover region was just over here, and now we've extended it all the way up here. And so now we just need to be in alignment all the way up. So it's still possible, but now you got to go back and do your crossover alignment. So um, that's not very common though, right? So more likely we're going to insert a filter like this. And then if we go over and take a look at the phase graph here, and we take this filter in and take it out, we see that there's a minor shift here. And if we switch this to the phase graph, then we watch down here. Then when I bypass that filter, we see that we're actually linearizing the phase at the same time as we're linearizing the magnitude. So uh, we get both as we fix the magnitude, we fix the phase. Um, so I guess that's debatable, but what you see here is that it's a pretty minor change, right? So with this 4 dB filter, we're creating a minor amount of phase shift, about 15 degrees on either side of this center frequency. Okay, so I think first takeaway here from just playing around with filters is that a little filter like that, that is pretty far outside of the crossover region is nothing to worry about. So I shouldn't uh, be afraid of all of uh, inserting some filters there. So let's keep that bypass though to have kind of a clean slate here. Uh, I got a list here of things to try. We talked about that. We did this. What about a shell filter? So this comes up for me a lot that uh, I've gotten everything together and then I realize like, oh, now I turn on everything together in the room. I listen to the combined system and now the low mid buildup in my mains, for example, is maybe more than I want it to be. So I'm getting nervous now though because I know a low shelf will go all the way across here. Won't that insert you know, won't that create a bunch of phase shift and screw up my crossover alignment? Well, think about what you think might happen when I insert a low shelf and then we'll try it. So here's a low shelf. Um, it's at a thousand hertz and we're going to put in a minus 6 dB change here. Interestingly, of course, level changes, the level relationship changes that we expected. And so we would need to now change the uh, gain of the sub, but crossover alignment here hasn't changed that much. Uh, and what we see here in the phase graph is that most of the phase shift happening is around uh, the frequency around a thousand hertz, 
right? For a low shelf, what do you call that frequency? It's not the cutoff frequency. I guess that's the knee or something. So somebody tell me in the chat, what do you call that frequency for a, a shelf filter? Um, and then what we see is that we've got, we do have phase shift around that filter. And if I change that to be a lot more like 16 dB, okay, now we have about 66 degrees of phase shift. But by the time we get down here where the crossover region is, we get a lot closer to uh, zero degrees of phase shift. It looks like five, four, three degrees of phase shift. Okay. And so if we go back to what is probably more common in the field, something like minus six, and I head over to my subwoofer and offset it by 6 dB as well. So I maintain that level relationship that I had before. Then we see that we have almost the exact same relationship we did before. And you might notice that this would be the same thing as if we just inserted a low shelf across the entire um, combined system here and not just one. So have your choice, however you want to do it. But you can see that the relationship here and the alignment is maintained. So nothing to worry about. I think you should be able to use um, gentle low shelves as much as you want. Now, I guess we should try actually moving that filter. So let's see if shifting this filter down, we can actually screw up the crossover alignment. And we see the level changing, but the alignment's not changing that much. Uh, let's do the same thing again while we watch the phase graph this time. So I'll pull this back up here. And I'm just kind of looking at, okay, I see that we have matching slopes here. So do those slopes get unmatched if this filter comes down here? Yeah, they change a little bit, but you know, they're still within 60 degrees, which for me is a win and I'm not worried about it. So I feel like I could use low shelves all day long and it's not going to be a problem. Okay, we did verification parametric EQs and shelves. So what about high pass and low pass filters? This is kind of more the danger area that I see people just kind of reckless abandon. What I see people doing sometimes is they'll just play the thing. And they're like, I don't like the way that subwoofer sounds. It's too woofy. Let, let me put a low pass filter on there. So if you kind of just go about this willy nilly and you're on the subwoofer channel here and you say, okay, I'm going to insert, you know, just a regular old low pass filter here and and I'll pull this down here and I'll just sort of adjust it while I'm playing music until I think it sounds nice. What you're going to hear, which may sound nice in the moment, if you're listening to combined systems, is you'll hear this dip start happening. And what's funny is that that might actually sound better in the moment and wherever your location is, whatever's going on with the system, this might actually sound better. So then you go with a misalignment because you're like, oh, I did a little dip here. I don't know really what's going on, but as I turn this down, oh, that's, that's sounding good right there. But now you've got this weird thing going on here. So there's nothing wrong with doing whatever you want to make the thing sound the way you want. Just realize that, you know, where you're standing and listening to this thing might not be what's happening in the rest of the audience. And, you know, you might have some unhappy customers later on. But there is an easy way, an easier way to go about this. And that's by applying symmetrical filters that are, let's say, just basically divisible by 12. So when I open this drop down menu here and you look at all the Linkwitz Riley filters, 12, 24, 36, 48, you can apply any of those filters symmetrically to both channels if you don't like how wide the crossover relationship is or you just want to experiment, you just want to hear how it sounds, but you have to apply it to both channels and sometimes they need a polarity inversion. Um, I made a whole video demonstrating this, which I will link to here. So let's see how this works. Let's say that um, you've decided this crossover relationship is too wide. You want something more narrow. You don't like the way this sounds, X, Y, Z. So let's put in a filter in somewhere in this area where we have, you know, high coherence, high probability that this division of labor will work better. So that's about 
90 hertz, right? So I'll put in this 24 dB proactive filter at 90 hertz. I'll go to my main and I'll put in a, another 24 dB proactive filter and put it at 90 hertz. And now we've maintained our crossover relationship here. And so now we may need to do a little bit of, I don't know, level change or EQ to make us happy with this. But look, it's aligned and we have a um, much narrower bandwidth um, relationship here. And we can keep doing this all day long. So we could change this to 36 on both sides. And just remember, sometimes you need a polarity inversion and that's going to be consistent all the time. I'm just saying sometimes because uh, for me, I found it's just easier to just like put it in and then I see, oh, I have a cancellation. I must need a polarity inversion. But if you just memorize which ones needed a polarity inversion and which ones didn't, that would be a lot smarter. Where this can go wrong is if you start just playing around with other things that are not divisible by 12. So let's try an 18 dB per octave filter here and an 18 dB per octave filter here. And even with the polarity inversion, we're never going to get quite up there because these phase traces are going to be um, apart by about 90 degrees. And another cool thing you can do is mix and match. It doesn't have to be the exact same topology. So although the topologies change a lot in the magnitude around the cutoff frequency, um, I found that the phase is actually really consistent. And even if, you know, our phase values are apart by a few degrees, that's okay if we're getting a relationship and a sound that we like. So let me show you what I mean. Let's go back to something that was working. We're at 24 dB per octave and 24 dB per octave. Everything's aligned. Now, if I wanted to, let's say I want to make a change in this area. So I'll head over to my main and I'll say, let me try another 24 dB per octave filter, but Butterworth. Oh, nice. I actually like that uh, better. It looks better. Let me audition it, see what it sounds like. And we'll see over here in the phase graph that we still have matched slopes. So I could go back to Lequence Riley 24 dB per octave, and we see there's a little change there, but I would say it is not super drastic, right? We are still in alignment and now we can kind of sculpt our <laughs> magnitude relationships a little bit here without fear. So those are the main things I wanted to look at. Let me know if there's anything else about EQ that you are worried about when it comes to alignment. Um, maybe there's something I forgot to try, um, but let's have a quick recap here. Number one, if you are just in a hurry, can't remember anything and want to be completely safe, then just treat your aligned systems like a unit. EQ them like a unit, adjust the level like a unit, and don't mess with them. But we saw that the crossover alignment is not super fragile. You can do stuff that you need to, especially if you need to insert a parametric EQ filter that is, you know, here pretty far out of the crossover range. Go ahead and do that. Don't worry about it. Low shelf filters you can do. You'll probably just need to make a corresponding change in the level relationship between your two sources. Um, but don't let any of those things stop you from trying to get the results that you want. And finally, you know, get these traces, download these traces ahead of time, these measurements, take a look at them and do your experiments the day before, you know, when you can do them without the stress and the pressure of trying to get a live event set up. All right. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.